Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm here in Grays Lake, Illinois at Reformed Forum office studio. And delighted to be back with uh, several people. We've got a, a great full panel. We have two guests, but before I introduce uh, them to you today, I want to introduce uh, Jim Cassidy, uh, the the president of the board here at Reformed Forum, and longtime contributor and a co-founder. He's also pastor, and this is most importantly, pastor of South Austin OPC down in South Austin, Texas. Welcome back, Jim. It's so good to see you and talk to you today. Yeah, it's good to be here, Camden. It's great to see other people other than my family. I love my family, <laughs> love seeing their faces, but it's really nice to see other faces too. Yeah, I can concur. Uh, it's it's good to get online, and, and even though we've been doing this this way for, for many, many years, uh, it's especially sweet and uh, useful to us in the midst of uh, these times and these pandemic. Let me introduce to you today. First, we have uh, Dr. Greg Allison, who's Professor of Christian Theology at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's been on the program before talking about the Roman Catholic theology. We're going to talk about that a little bit today, too. But welcome, Greg. It's good to see you, too. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And uh, welcome back, at least through virtual means, to Northern Illinois. Uh, we know uh, you spent some time at uh, NIU, you're a Husky uh, and whatnot. So it's about uh, 40 minutes for me up here. But uh, we know we, we, we have a kinship. We do. That's right. They're good. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Um, uh, delighted also to be welcome into the program. Uh, someone who's been on many, many times before. We have uh, Dr. Carl Truman, who's professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College, calling in from Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Carl. It's good to see you too. It's great to be here, Camden. Thanks for asking me. Yeah. Well, uh, we have uh, all these folks online today because we're speaking about an important new book, uh, which has been published by Lexham Press. Uh, you can see here I've got a video. of uh, I've got the, the book holding up for the video, The Theology of Benedict the Sixteenth: A Protestant Appreciation. Uh, it's been edited by Tim Perry. Perhaps we can talk to him at some time uh, in the future, but we have uh, some of our folks who've been on the program before as contributors here to this wonderful book. And uh, it's a, there's a many, many, many contributions here, but we're going to be speaking about uh, Greg's chapter, Faith, Hope, and Love, Joseph Ratzinger on Theological Virtues, and then uh, Carl's Is the Pope Roman Catholic? Question uh, mark. Joseph Ratzinger on Ecumenism. So these are important subjects and uh, really good topics. So I want to do a couple plugs here and some mentions uh, up front. Um, if you haven't already, go head on over and uh, search for the Reformanda Initiative. They have a podcast. They started maybe about 20 weeks ago. I think they're in episodes 20, some something like that. Uh, there's some good brothers over there. I've mentioned on the program before, and uh, if you subscribe to their podcast, they're talking about uh, Roman Catholic theology from Rome itself. They're they're in the city of Rome. They're in Italy, and they're church planting and doing uh, excellent work as evangelicals in the midst of uh, kind of the, the Roman Catholic nexus. So if you would like to learn more about uh, Roman Catholic theology and uh, to understand how to interact with it and address it from a conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing uh, standpoint, you know, the same similar type of standpoint where we're coming from here as confessional, Reformed, and Presbyterians, uh, then that's an excellent podcast. And uh, Greg, maybe you could speak a little bit, because you've uh, been at work with the Reformanda Initiative, been out there uh, to speak with them, and uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of an insider window into into their helpful work. Yes. So each summer I participate in what we call Rome Scholar and Leadership Network. It is a primarily a course, a week-long course for evangelicals, uh, European, American, Australian, and all like that, uh, trying to uh, inform evangelicals uh, about the essence, the nature, the doctrine, the uh, practices of uh, Roman Catholicism. There seems to be an intrigue on the part of Protestants, on the part of evangelicals, intrigue with the Catholic Church. And we want to take a systemic approach to Roman Catholic theology and look at it as a worldview, uh, an all-encompassing systemic view of doctrine and practice, and alert evangelicals to both the commonalities as well as the differences between Protestant theology and practice and Roman Catholic theology and practice. Yeah, excellent. It's really quite useful. And uh, of course, you can take a look at some of Greg's writings. Uh, he has uh, several books on Roman Catholicism from the same 
vantage point and perspective. We'll have links to that in the episode description and links as well to our previous conversations uh, where we've we've talked about these issues. But Greg, your your uh, writing and perspective on these matters, your approach to them has been quite helpful in my my own understanding and. Also, our brother uh, Chris Castaldo uh, and conversations with him have always been fruitful and uh, very appreciative of your work. Looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks so much. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I guess I want to start off just by um, asking a little bit and providing an opportunity to introduce people to uh, the theology of, of Benedict the Sixteenth. Of course, uh, he is slash was the Pope. Uh, he's Pope Emeritus, I guess, technically. Uh, Francis is the current uh, Pope as uh, head of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Benedict uh, retired. Uh, Benedict uh, is given name, as Joseph and uh, his family name Ratzinger. So he, for many, many years, was a, was a big and leading figure in uh, Roman Catholic theology. As He's a German and uh, was very involved at Vatican II, had written extensively, and um, the well-known theologian, who became the Pope. And so not, you might assume that this would be the case, but it not always is where the Pope is, had, you know, for, for several years then, you know, was a leading intellectual in the field. They're not always leading theologians. It's not that they're not theologians, but they're not necessarily as, as intellectual and, and driven that way as Benedict was. But of course he retired and, and uh, Francis is, is now there and they're coming from a very different perspective. Um, when I hear the current Pope speaking, uh, he sounds familiar to me because of my studies in Karl Rahner. He's a Jesuit. He has liberation leanings. The things he talks about and the way he presents them, it makes sense within kind of a Rahnerian view. I'm not saying he's a devotee to Rahner, but what I hear sounds very familiar. And that's quite different from what we heard with, with Ratzinger. So discussing the differences there certainly is going to be interesting. Uh, but even before that, I know it's a fictionalized somewhat account, but have either of you been able to see Netflix's film, uh, The Two Popes? I watched it twice and enjoyed it thoroughly. How accurate it is, I have no idea because I wasn't there. But <laughs> I have not. My, oh. I, I want to, but my I need to wait until my wife is out shopping or something. <laughs> she will have no, no interest whatsoever. Oh, okay. I, I have not either. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah. Well, well, I, I do hear it's it's uh, not so accurate. Well, okay, fair enough. I can't imagine that it would be, but uh, I still thought it was a compelling film. Uh, I absolutely loved it the first time I saw it. The second time, a little of the luster came off. So the third time, I don't I don't know. So I don't trust myself. You know, I'm not going to say it's a superb, excellent film. It was it nominated for uh, Academy Awards? Anthony Hopkins, Jonathan Price, certainly capable actors. And uh, it was written well. It was engaging, so thought-provoking nonetheless, but you do see the contrast between two theological perspectives. Again, how close that is to reality, we don't know. My friends at First Things are not huge fans from what I can pick up from them. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't paint uh, Benedict in the light that they would prefer. But um, And plus they dance at the end together, so there, <laughs> there, might, be, there might be something else there going on. Uh, um <laughs> Carl, I guess I'll ask you just to begin uh, about your, I remember when, when Benedict became the Pope and you'd written some blog posts and, and whatnot uh, in, in reaction, kind of people were salivating that we actually had a Catholic Pope now um, and somebody who stood up for, there are different reasons people were interested. There's somebody who stood up for conservative values and political ideology and things that were useful for evangelicals to, to have partners in, but also a Catholic who actually you know, had some notion of, of a, a solid conservative tradition and was willing to, to say things, you know, like, if you don't believe in this, then you're not a Catholic in good standing. Um, how were you introduced to, to Ratzinger? Did you have any, any history reading him beforehand, or, or were you kind of introduced to him uh, seemingly as the rest of the evangelical world? I, I first came across his name when I was at undergraduate at Cambridge in the late 80s. And it must have been around about 1986, 1987. He actually came to the university and, and, and gave a lecture. And, you know, I was not interested in serious things in those days. So I was not present at the lecture. But that was the first time I came across his name. I didn't pay much attention to his, his writings really until uh, John Paul II passed from the scene and, uh, and Ratzinger was, was elected Pope. Then he became a, 
uh, a figure of, of much greater interest to me. And I, I was somewhat intrigued, and, and some of this lies in the background to the article I wrote for this volume. I was intrigued by the fact that on the one hand, uh, and I felt this myself, like a lot of Protestants, I found a lot to admire in, in the man, uh, not just his, you say, his conservative stand on sexuality, but also his, uh, his thinking about modern, particularly modern European culture. I think maybe that's part of him that speaks more to me as a European than would, would speak to people in North America. Uh, and, and also his, as you pointed to, his, his, well, I can use this term. He's like a confessional Catholic. What you yeah. see is what you get. He yeah. does take the catechism seriously. The flip side of that has always intrigued me is that that so many conservative Protestants do love him. And ironically, as has been pointed out by a number of conservative and more liberal Catholics, ironically, what makes us Protestant, for example, our views of contraception, are precisely the things, the points which make a, a conservative Catholic a conservative Catholic and where we would disagree with them. So it's also struck me as culturally interesting that conservative Protestants seem to like Benedict. And yet in actual fact, on, on a number of the principal points that make him a conservative Catholic, we have more in common with, perhaps with Pope Francis and some of his, uh, sure. his fans. So I've always did, thought of him as a, a rather intriguing figure, particularly in the way he's been received in the, in the conservative Protestant community. Mm -hmm. Now, Greg, I, I imagine you had read Ratzinger prior. Um, were you surprised uh, of his selection as Pope? What were you thinking at the time that he was presented? So in the... Um towards the end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, is when I really focused on reading in Roman Catholic theology. And of course, at that time, beginning in 1981, he was prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And of course, the director of the whole project, which is now the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So that's the main way that I became aware of him. Uh, the fact of his selection as Pope, as another non-Italian Pope, yes, I think was shocking. Um, but uh, like Carl said, uh, you do see, you, you, you see what you, you get what you see with, uh, with uh, Benedict XVI. And uh, rather than some of the ambiguity that we might see with a Francis, we see uh, very much the lines drawn uh, by uh, Ratzinger, by Benedict XVI. And uh, I, as a confessional Protestant, appreciate that clarity. For example, when he talks about Protestant gatherings, not as churches, but as ecclesial communities, we may be shocked by that, but it is true, right? That is the Catholic stance. And for him to say that, articulate it, I find particularly helpful. Yeah, it's refreshing in, in some ways. Although even from within certain quarters of, of Catholicism, he's not a beloved figure. <laughs> some people love uh, love him and appreciate this return to this uh, this more harder line. Some people have uh, even, he's earned the nickname of God's Rottweiler, kind of a play on his, his last name. But I was talking to uh, Bob Strimple, a retired professor from Westminster California. He taught at Westminster um, in Philadelphia before moving out to California. But he was attending a, a meeting of the Catholic Theological Society of America one year. And uh, and uh, there was a, a gathering, kind of one of the joint meetings of the whole group before they do their breakouts. And for some reason, somebody from the panel or the president, somebody mentioned uh, Ratzinger. And he said there were just, it was like British Parliament. There were just boos and hisses and people throwing things <laughs> because they just <laughs> didn't even want to hear his name. And to think of that kind of visceral response and then, you know, however many, maybe two decades later, this that same man would be the Pope. Uh, I wonder what they were saying after that. It, it definitely uh, opens the eyes, I think. And a lot of evangelicals, I think, have a harder time understanding the 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 breadth of the Catholic Church and the wide views. You just assume if he's the Pope, then they must all love him and like him. But it, other people view the Pope as kind of the way certain citizens might view the president. Well, he is who he is. We got to put up with him for his term and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll bide our time and, and take what he says, but we might not like it. And so now we have the phenomenon of Francis, right. who is 
deeply loved by the more liberal progressive wing Mm -hmm. and denounced uh, pretty thoroughly by the conservative wing. We have someone like an Eduardo Echeverria up in Detroit at the seminary there, uh, you know, who has written extensively about Francis and expressed deep concerns. And so you've got more conservative wing of the Catholic Church who would say, we don't want to have anything to do with Francis, and he is denying what we stand for. Yeah, I had I have a Catholic friend and I asked him how he'd rate Francis, and he said, oh, he's a truly, truly terrible pope. <laughs> then he followed up by saying, but I'd still put him in the top third, which I thought was an interesting <laughs> oh <my>. comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Well, um, Greg, I'd love to ask you a few questions just to start off about uh, your particular uh, essay, which I very much enjoyed. It's on the theological virtues. And that, that's something that is uh, very deeply ingrained in traditional Catholic theology. And uh, I hope a, a lot of um, Protestants understand it as well, except we don't often go around talking about the theological virtues per se. It's not something that is in the just the, the vocabulary. But once it's explained, obviously, it, it, it's apparent. But can you introduce that idea to, to our listeners and, and kind of explain why this is an important subject in, in dogmatic studies? The theological virtues are faith, hope, and love. And as soon as we nominate those three, we acknowledge that those themes course through the Bible, of course. They are concentrated in various places, even together. Our minds probably would go first and foremost to 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul brings these together. And so uh, what... uh, what Benedict XVI has done um, is to take these theological virtues and ask the question, how do they apply to theologians who are engaged in the task of doing theology? And I, and, and hence the whole notion of my essay. Mm-hmm. No, that's quite useful. So where th- then does, does Ratzinger interact with uh, and address these in relation to the specific task of the theologian? Um, in many of his writings, but there are two principal ones that I would say, they're very concentrated here. Uh, The Nature and Mission of Theology, uh, subtitled Essays to Orient Theology in Today's Debates, and then in Ratzinger's Introduction to Christianity. These are two places where he primarily deals with them. Mm -hmm. Now, another one of the the relations that that Ratzinger deals with, he's he's kind of always addressing this holistic kind of view of things. Uh, He's rigorous. He's a rigorous thinker, and that's something I very much appreciate about him. But it's uh, it's another one of those connections that, at least in our circles, uh, Carl (laughs) surely has a lot to say about this too, Uh, but in in the reform circles, especially those kind of influenced by neo-Kyperianism and then how they relate to Thomism and other areas, is the relationship between theology and philosophy. Now, I came to learn with the, my, my studies and Carl Rahner how, how those can be very sharply distinguished sometimes uh, in Catholic studies, where Rahner started off as a, a philosophy student and then failed because his, his uh, advisor didn't like him, didn't like the, uh, the proposals he was issuing in his dissertation, so he had to flip to the other, and the Jesuit order allowed him to do that. And uh, then his dissertation became very much uh, one of the most influential books he wrote, The Spirit in the World. There are issues in which uh, these two relate, but other people want to keep them very precisely separate. And uh, how how does Ratzinger address this particular issue of theology and philosophy in their two re- in their relation? Oh, he definitely sees them as intimately connected. Uh, for Benedict, uh, revelation is at the heart of theology, and he would even say theology is a rational reflection on God's revelation. And he and he likes to use this uh, traditional expression. Uh, faith-seeking understanding. Uh, And so this is what the essence of theology is, faith-seeking understanding, yet uh, theology, faith-seeking understanding, can never stand alone. Theology needs to be done in conjunction with philosophy. Now, he uses both Martin Luther and Karl Barth as uh, 
Protestant giants who were opposed to philosophy. Now that's another debate, but uh, he does not want theology to be opposed, disconnected from philosophy, like in his view, Luther and Barth did. So uh, whether that's true or not, that's another point to debate, but it sh just shows you the interconnectedness of these, of these two disciplines. Uh, it, most importantly, I think, uh, Benedict did not champion philosophy as supplying content for theology, but rather philosophy pointing to the manner, the form in which theology uh, should proceed. Interesting. Carl, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. I mean, I'm, I hear Luther, and I've got Carl Truman, so I think it's yeah. imperative that I— uh, it's not indicative. It's imperative that I that I ask you a question. But I mean, I'm also curious on the angle of this, the way Ratzinger is approaching this task of the theologian. You know, this perhaps is an open ended question, but I'm also curious how you how you might see this dovetailing with his ecumenical concerns. Is there is there something to be had there in connection, or uh, or do you find those as just independent issues? I'm sure there probably it's not a I'm sure there probably is it's not a connection I've reflected mm -hmm. on uh, to any great extent. I think part of the problem, of course, comes down to uh, the interpretation of Luther. The relationship between theology and philosophy in Luther is is highly contested, uh, and there's almost a sense in in which Luther's dramatic antithesis that he rhetorically states opposing philosophy to theology is unsustainable in terms of what he actually does. I mean, Luther uses, uses syllogisms when he's dealing with the horizontal. He's comfortable using Aristotelian categories, even if he doesn't explicitly ascribe them to Aristotle. So, you know, if I was coming at, at Ratzinger from that perspective, my first question would be, let's, well, my first approach would be, let's look at how he deals with Luther and let's see if that's an accurate approach to to Luther's task. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I'd, I think I'd also want to add, uh, and I think this was lying behind what, what Greg was saying, you know, Ratzinger needs to be set against the background of John Paul II's uh, pontificate as well. And John Paul II was in some ways the quintessential philosopher pope uh, of the last few hundred years anyway. And, and Ratzinger in some ways represents both the continuation of that and a more revelational emphasis uh, at the same time. So that too, I think, would be a, an important part of the analysis of, of Ratzinger, Revelation, and, and philosophy. Now, you know, certainly many Protestants might might be initially attracted to a notion of rigorous intellectualism. Uh, they might even learn something of the method uh, that Ratzinger is proposing, and here, as Greg's, uh, you know, introduced to us, this idea of thinking through seriously how the theological virtues might impact the the task of the theologian. But there's a something you mentioned here on page uh, 153 of the essay. You write that Roman Catholicism is not simply Protestantism with a different set of doctrines. That's really significant, uh, especially in, within the consideration of ecumenism. But what do you what do you mean by that idea? Why why include that here? And how is that helpful for us to understand? Because we're we're here, you know, speaking about a book subtitled "The Protestant Appreciation of of a Pope," but yet a sober understanding and assessment here that these. We haven't just uh, put a little bit different fuel in the same machine. Yeah, I, this is something that that became clear to me. It was actually my very first job. I taught theology at the University of Nottingham for five years in the in the mid '90s, and one of my colleagues was a Roman Catholic nun. She was very liberal. She was a big Rana kind of Roman Catholic. But I remember having a coffee conversation with her one day. I can't remember what the the dogma was that she was expecting the Pope to define. And I asked her, you know, do, do you think this, this is true? And she said, oh, no, no, it's nonsense. <laughs> I said, well, what happens if the Pope defines this as dogma? And she said, oh, well, I, it, would it would be true then. I would, I would have to believe it. <laughs> and that brought out to me in a way that nothing else since ever has done, that there can be huge common ground in terms of what Protestants and Catholics believe. I've benefited immensely from reading uh, uh, Benedict's stuff on, on personhood in Trinitarian debates in the early church. He's mm -hmm. written some great articles on mm -hmm. that. And um, we have that sort of Nicene Chalcedonian uh, doctrine that we share. But the reason we believe it's true <laughs> seems to me to be profoundly 
different, certainly for, I would say, thoughtful and reflective Catholics and Protestants. Uh, the foundation for our belief is, is somewhat different. And that's not to say that we don't believe the same things, but it's to say that we often believe the same things, but for very different reasons. For us on this uh, uh, podcast, it's scripture that has the ultimate authority and ultimate say so. In Roman Catholicism, you cannot separate the authority of scripture from the authority of the, the institutional right. Roman church. And that makes all the difference. And I think it's the failure of Protestants to to see that that makes us too quick sometimes to see common ground with Rome, uh, where maybe we shouldn't see common ground, and perhaps on the other side of things, not quick enough to see common ground when there is actually common ground as well. Uh, yeah. Catholicism is not Protestantism, but it's not completely different from Protestantism either. And I think the question of authority is is critical in, in parsing that issue. Yeah, I think uh, Greg and I were, were commenting prior to this through the, the work of the Reformanda Initiative. Uh, uh, one of their contributors is uh, Leonardo de Quirico, who has done tremendous work. And, and um, when he was on the program, he explained very succinctly and capably a lot of the similar ideas that, that Greg has included in his uh, book from Crossway on, um, on Roman Catholicism, and that's the, the Christ Church Interconnection. But really, for the Roman Catholic Church, the, the, the institution, the visible church is, you know, for lack of a nuanced, you know, development here, it's the continuation of the incarnation. And so the Pope has a very significant place within that as the, the head, the vicar of Christ, but the head of the church. It's, it's not just head of a visible institution, but the continuation of the incarnation, quite literally the body of Christ, not merely mystically and spiritually, although that is true, but there's something even more tangible and palpable about that, which informs greatly the notion of authority. Because then if you have the the continuing incarnation, if Jesus was here in the flesh, and he'll come back again, but if he was standing right here in the flesh and told you something, uh, <laughs> that's that, and, and you better believe it and better go about it. So it, it makes sense, again, once you get within the system, but there are greater questions about the nature of the system itself. So that th this isn't uh, as simple. Addressing Roman Catholicism from a Protestant standpoint is not as simple as just lining up some doctrines and thinking through them and seeing what you agree with and what you don't. They're, they're deep, deep-seated differences at, at, at the foundational level. I think you see some of this as well in the debates that currently swirl in conservative Catholic quarters around the pontificate of Francis. You know, these questions, is it possible for the Pope to be a heretic? These yeah. kind of questions that don't have any easy resolution, but are genuinely perplexing and distressing the conservatives because they feel we have a man here who could say something completely crazy, mm -hmm. could say something completely crazy ex cathedra. How do we how do we deal with that? What, what does that mean? Yeah, um, I was an observer at a meeting uh, of, of a number of, of high powered Catholics a few years ago, and I heard them talking in very real terms about schism. Uh, my mm. only contribution to the debate was I am a schismatic. I can thoroughly <laughs> recommend it. You know, come and speak to my church session. Uh, but uh, the the idea that there could be a break in the church. That's incredibly painful to Catholics, but has become something of a real possibility because we are seeing this potential of a gap between the past teaching of the church and the current teaching of this Pope uh, emerging. Well, yeah, and then there's questions and, and issues on how this relates to Vatican II teaching, which you address. Um, there, yeah. there are many layers to this. We can we can try to unfold and discuss. To get back on, on track, at least with what uh, Greg was developing with the theological virtues, and it's un, it's related to what we're, we're talking about right now, but it's the connection between reason and faith as well. And, and Ratzinger warns against separating these, but he uses a word— uh, pathologies when he's talking about separating you know the the danger of and the issues that may obtain when you, one separates reason from faith uh, greg what is what does ratzinger mean when he so, speaks about pathologies yes so i uh, just a little broader context here uh for benedict there are four prerequisites for theology that would be faith reason conversion and truth so let's just look at the first two. Faith and reason are intimately tied together. Again, 
uh, the, the prerequisite of faith means that theology is faith seeking understanding. Uh, the second prerequisite reason means that our faith needs to be informed by and needs to reason properly uh, you know, about truths about God and his ways in this world. Um, but then for Benedict, if there is a separation of these two, these two should be together, but if there's a separation of the two, it leads to disastrous consequences, which he calls pathologies, and he lists three. Uh, the first would be faith without reason. Uh, that leads to fideism. So the infamous leap of faith uh, beyond reason, at times even contradictory to reason. The second would be reason without faith. Benedict says that leads to nihilism, uh, denial of any objective ground for truth, uh, existence is meaningless, and so forth. The third, pure reason is non-existent. Pure reason as uh, reason without any admixture of experience, anything subjective, uh, tradition, revelation, faith, religious convictions and things like that. So these three are pathologies that arise when faith is not connected intimately to reason and vice versa. Hmm. That's, um, that's interesting. And, and the way in which it it's sort of going back to our previous discussion about philosophy and theology, um, and of course, there's a parallel there on the age old question of the relationship between faith and, and reason. Um, you know, just thinking back, you had mentioned, Greg, about Bart uh, and Luther, but uh, Bart's the one that I'm particularly interested in. Maybe you could illuminate a little bit more on this. For, for someone like Karl Barth, um, and I think maybe Luther, but not an expert there, Karl would have to speak to this, not me, um, but at least with regard to Barth, when he says philosophy, almost always and everywhere, what he has in view is the older Greek metaphysical system of Aristotle, right? So, um, you know, you have this uh, tradition that Bart is very concerned about, uh, that, that, that feeds into this metaphysical tradition that feeds into the notion of the analogia entis, right? This sort of bringing God and man uh, together relationally on the basis of ontological commonality or something like that. Um, is that is that the way in which um, when, when Roman Catholicism or maybe Ratzinger particularly, when they're talking about philosophy or reason in this case, are they speaking and are they thinking philosophy and reason in a more general sense? Like it could be any philosophy or any use of reason whatsoever, including just basic use of logic. Or is there, when they say philosophy, having something more narrowly conceived, like a partic like the particular Greek philosophical tradition? Yeah, that's a great question. So philosophy would certainly include logic. And I think Carl picked up on this a few minutes ago when he talked about use of syllogism and all like that. So philosophy definitely engages, is, is about logic and rational argumentation, reason and things like that. Um, so I think what uh, Ratzinger is against is anti-Christian, uh, naturalistic philosophy and things like that. But uh, by philosophy, uh, France, uh, uh, sorry, Benedict is also going to mean uh, Thomistic theology, philosophy, drawing on the Greek Aristotelian tradition. So he's going to also include that in his notion of philosophy. Well, and also there's, I imagine in the background, it, it, I, I have not been a Latin student, but Eternity Patris from 1879, the, the uh, encyclical from Leo the Thirteenth, which the function of that was basically to place the stamp of approval of Thomas Thomas's philosophy as the official philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church, which led to uh, a whole reaction in the age of modernism in which many theologians, now they're required by the Pope, so to speak, to be Thomistic in their philosophy, but they might not like it. So many modernists and liberals came up with modernistic ways to be a Thomist on the surface, but yet to 
transcendent, which gave rise to that that label of transcendental Thomism, which is kind of like a a Kantian inspired take on Thomas, which isn't Tom, Thomism at all. So you end up with all these kind of like pretzel twists and whatnot. And I imagine Ratzinger is much more interested in a in a genuine holistic view of these things rather than finding clever theological and philosophical ways to maneuver out of them. In, in fact, for Benedict, Thomas Aquinas is the quintessential model of that relationship, the harmony between faith and reason. Mm. So um, I should ask then, how does conversion and truth play in? Those are the other two. We got faith and reason. Uh, what about the other the other two aspects? Yes, so the third and fourth prerequisite for uh, doing theology, conversion and truth. So conversion, so for Benedict, uh, the theologian uh, is one who has experienced um, a relationship with God, the, the invasion of God into the theologian's life and, and faith then in this um, reality of God. It's not just intellectual, it's not just emotional, it's not just volitional, it's the faith, it's the act of the whole person entrusting himself or herself to the word of God in the flesh. And uh, so this act of faith uh, encounter with God is what Benedict would call conversion. And there's no uh, theology without faith, so there can be no theology without conversion. And he particularly focuses on Galatians 2.20 as conversion being both turning from the old I, the old self, uh, which has been crucified with Christ, and a turning to the new I or the new self, who no longer lives as before, but now lives by faith in Christ. And he sees this as conversion. And so converted theologians are those who rightly engage and creatively engage in theology. And far, as far as truth goes, he really focuses on truth as God's revealed word, not a postulate of reason, uh, not a proposition, but a person. So uh, truth is personal in that it is placed in a person who is the word, who is revealed by the written word. And so the principal task of a theologian is to focus on scripture, to learn about truth of the word revealed. Now, this, this leads me to, to several questions for you, Carl, about ecumenism, uh, particularly in light of Vatican II. Because uh, Ratzinger, Bened Pope Benedict, is, is spoken of the importance of these, these matters, that there be some sort of you know, change, that there's conversion for real theology to happen. But yet, the product of Vatican II, again, interpretation of it is still debated even what are we, 60 years past now, uh, 1965 uh, to, to 2020. So many people have viewed uh, this being a great liberalizing of the church. That's a debated interpretation. But nevertheless, the Catholic Church coming out of the, of, um, of the council has, has a different relation, or at least visible relation, to world religions. And, and you look, you mentioned the Lumen Gentium uh, chapter 8 or paragraph 8, uh, as a feature of Catholic ecclesiology, and um, it, it's a it's a one little word uh, in the final version, which is different from earlier versions. But that one little word in the final version there speaks volumes in terms of uh, this the shift in understanding. Can you uh, you know set the stage for us, or at least describe a little bit of uh, current Catholic ecclesiology in light of? Uh, these ecumenical issues? Well, I think the Vatican II really does provide the, the framework for what Benedict did in his, in his pontificate. And probably the most notorious uh, ecumenical or, or, depending on your perspective, anti-ecumenical act was his move in 2009 to effectively allow disillusioned Anglican priests to fast track into the uh, into the Roman Catholic Church. I happened to be, I was with the Reformanda people actually in December 2009, just after that thing went down, I went to the bookstore in uh, 
uh, the Gregorian University, and there was this wow. long line of nuns queuing up to buy <laughs> their little copies of the uh, the Anglican Ordinariat rules, uh, and I think that came as a shock. But of course, it's it's entirely consistent with with what's taught at Vatican II, or at least a legitimate interpretation of what's taught at Vatican II, and that is that uh, Rome is the true Church. Uh, there are Church, there are Christians, we might say, and gatherings of Christians that exist outside of the Roman communion. And therefore, the, the agenda of ecumenism is to bring those people back into the Roman church. I think Protestants, we when we think of ecumenism, whether we're for it or against it, we tend to think of it in terms of, of mutually respecting coalitions of churches or, or, or bodies of believers. Rome, I think, is, is very clear and very consistent with, with its position over the centuries that Rome is the true church and therefore ecumenism, whatever it may look like in practice in terms of how it's pursued on the ground, the end goal is that everybody is brought back into, into the Roman church. And I think that's the, the key that a lot of Protestants miss when they engage in ec ecumenical dialogue with Rome. They think the agenda is to move to a a bit of it, a tertium quid, something that's neither Rome nor Anglican, but a kind of accommodation of both sides. I think Rome, the approach is, is not that. It's, uh, it's to be accommodated, to be brought back in to the Roman communion. And yeah. that's where I think a lot of the, the tension kicked off uh, relative to Benedict, because here we'd got this man who seemed to take Christian orthodoxy seriously, orthodoxy we share in terms of the great creeds of the church, and yet didn't realize that he's also actually truly Roman Catholic. And guess what? That means he thinks the Roman Catholic Church is superior uh, to Eastern orthodoxy and actually a church, as opposed to what Anglicanism or the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, were he ever to hear of it, it is. Sure. Uh, and that is simply a, 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 a gathering of believers. If we yeah, the baptized. So he'd see some yeah. measure of uh, Christian there, those who have been baptized appropriately. Yeah, they don't want to be Donatist on baptism. Sure. But they don't regard uh, Greg's church or my church or your church as being true churches. Right. It's interesting here just to read this this quotation because and I really appreciated your your article because I think I think I had come to more of an unbalanced view of Lumen Lumen Gentium apologies for my pronunciation. Um uh you know a much more liberal view uh mainly because of what I've been steeped in. I appreciated your your take on on Benedict and Ratzinger, and and also showing the continuity that that he's now also not undoing Vatican II, but yet there there are different ways to read this, and that's kind of the point with these with these uh, documents coming out of Vatican II. They're they're constructed, they're negotiated, they're written in ways that everyone can kind of live with. But here here's the final product, and I'll explain what it, what early drafts of it said. So this is Lumen Gentium, uh, paragraph eight. Uh, section 8, if you want to read. This church, constituted and organized in the world as a society, subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure, these elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. Now, an earlier version did not use the verb uh, subsists in, translated in English as subsists, and it was much more uh, exclusive and strong. It was more of just, I think, est. It was just, it was the is of identity. This church is the Catholic Church. And so the, the, the shift to speak of subsistence still places the primacy from the Roman Catholic perspective on the Roman Catholic Church, but it is not in an exclusive way. It's more of what we call this in missions, this inclusivism. Is still, from their perspective, best and most important to be uh, visibly associated and, and tied to the body, uh, to the head of the visible body. But it doesn't preclude there being Protestants who could be saved, but yet outside of the church. It's an interesting way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it's it also highlights, as, as I try to do in the article, that there is a distinct difference in the Roman Catholic mindset between 
Protestants and Eastern, yeah, and Eastern Orthodoxy. Orthodox, right. Eastern Orthodoxy, that's a ch- that is a church. It may be imperfect and there may be problems there, but Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy have potentially a much more fruitful relationship, if you like, than, than Protestants do. One might almost say that for a Protestant mm-hmm. to really engage in dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church as a church, we have to leave everything that makes us Protestant at the door. That has to be <laughs> checked at the door in order for that discussion to take place. That's not to say we can't have good friendships, fellowship one-on-one with, with Catholic friends, but it is to say that at that, that an institutional level, uh, ecumenism is is not going to take place, I don't think, between Protestants and Catholics on the basis yeah. of Vatican II. I think it's precluded. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the ordinariate. Um, provide the background for that, because it, it, it's described well in, in the issues therein developed in, in your article. But I, th- I think people would be interested to hear about this uh, with, in the relationship between the, the Anglican Church and the, and the Catholic Church and the things that happened thereabouts in 2009. Yeah, the ordinariat was, uh, as far as I uh, as I can tell, it caught Rowan Williams, who was then the Archbishop of Canterbury, somewhat by surprise. What the ordinariat is, is essentially a, a fast track into the Roman Catholic Church for disillusioned Anglican priests. Uh, uh, I left the UK in 2001, so I, I, I was not as au fait with what's going on in the UK since then. But certainly since the early, I would say, 1980s onwards with the... Uh, First of all, with the move to ordain women, and then with the whole debate about uh, sexuality, the legitimacy of homosexuality, etc., uh, you had a, a wing of the the Anglican Church which was not evangelical; uh, it was Anglo-Catholic. It, it sort of took its cue from well, Anglo-Catholicism. Its roots go back go back a long way, but certainly it had a lot of impetus in the 19th century with the Oxford movement. Right, it was Jump orthodox on basic theology and orthodox on basic morals and ethics, and had a high view of ecclesiology and tradition as well. And from the early 1980s onwards, there was a steady trickle, uh, I would say, of of high-profile vicars and uh, officials within the Anglican Church moving Romeward. Of course, a move to Rome can be difficult, because if you're a, a married vicar and you want to go to Rome, you may have to give up, you know, marital relations with your wife, those kind of things. So, Which might have been ordinary. advantageous to one or two of those people. I don't know. I'm not making any, any statements, but maybe they wanted to get rid of their wives. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can only ever generalize. I wouldn't want to speculate about the motive of any particular individual. But what the ordinary did was, uh, and, and I think this would have somewhat ticked me off were I a Catholic, actually. The ordinary essentially made it easier for Anglican vicars to become Catholic priests without having to be subject to all of the strictures of the Catholic priesthood than it did for Catholic lay people to become Catholic priests. Uh, so it was, on one level, I think it was a, a brilliant strategic, maybe even a cynical move by the Pope to to wrong foot uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury after several decades of, of Anglican Roman Catholic uh, ecumenism. It provided, I'm sure it provided a number of uh, of good Anglican priests with a quick get out from, from an increasingly sticky situation within their own church. But it was uh, it was an interestingly cynical move, I think, at the time. And the fact that uh, Rowan Williams doesn't seem to have been extensively consulted about it in advance made it, uh, I would say, diplomatically very tricky move hmm. as well. Wow. You remember this, Greg? Or uh, I wasn't up on it at the time. And, and uh, this is many of the, much of this was kind of new to me. Yes, even previous to 2009, Protestant ministers could apply for a special dispensation from the Pope to become a Catholic priest. So I've known a handful of married Protestant ministers uh, who became Catholic priests. They were not required to give up their wife uh, and their children. They would live like those of us who are married with children would have. Uh, The couple that I knew were primarily uh, directed into educational ministries in the church. So they would not be as visible uh, leading a parish. So you wouldn't have this contrast with, here's a married priest. We know his wife and his kids are sitting in the front pew. 
uh, and, and then give perhaps give a mixed signals. So more like more towards educational ministries. Yeah, that makes sense. Or or even maybe administrative, I suppose, working somehow in a diocese or something like that might be a place for folks of that type. I think I'm right in saying, Greg, you might you might be able to either confirm or correct me on this, that if you make that move and then your wife dies, you're not allowed to marry again. I think then the that celibacy kicks in. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Wow. But but I think this is a good illustration of what Carl was saying earlier, that the mission of the Roman Catholic Church, even under the guise of ecumenism, is to draw all Protestant ecclesial communities, all other religions, the entire world into the bosom of the Catholic Church. So if there is so if the Catholic Church is the totus Christus, Augustine's expression. If it is the whole Christ, deity, humanity, and body, then of course the one true Church of Jesus Christ must subsist in the Roman Catholic Church, and 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 we are as Protestants are part of ecclesial communities. Yes, we can be saved. Yes, we have examples of sanctification, prayer, scripture, uh, the Lord's Supper, things like that. But we can't be churches. We lack apostolic succession. We lack a true a Eucharist. We lack priests who can actually transubstantiate the elements and all. So yes, we can be saved, but we can't be a true church until we come into the heart of the Catholic Church and become Roman Catholic. I think that is the mission. And there would necessarily then, presumably, be a roadmap or a way to do that. That And that's what these are evidences of. How would somebody come in? There would have to be some sort of a pathway unless they'd have to give up uh, ordination altogether, which would also be conceivable within within the Catholic view. But here, the Anglican priests are encouraged and right. enabled to become Catholic priests. And I think the idea would be they would bring congregational members with them, right? Yeah, yeah. Which would be part of the point long term from, yeah, the, from, exactly. from the Catholic view. That happened view in Philadelphia, and, I think. We've had, we had at least one whole congregation, church? I think, of the Episcopal Church, I think, move into the ordinariat and the, the bulk of the congregation went with the, the pastor slash priest at that point. Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, let's get back uh, to and connect uh, the dots with the theological virtues, speaking of, of faith, hope, and love. Um, you know, Ratzinger starts off, uh, Benedict, with, uh, with faith. How does he, how does he categorize and, and define that? You know, at, at least coming from the Presbyterian side and the people who subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith and catechisms, we have a very succinct uh, definition of, of saving faith, at least. But how does, how does Benedict understand faith as a theological virtue? Let me quote him: "The Good. life of faith is a path that leads to the knowledge of an encounter with God. Faith, in fact." is an encounter with God who speaks and works in history and converts our daily life, transforming within us mentalities, value judgments, decisions, and practical actions. So faith is at the very core of our existence. It, it, it transforms everything. Uh, so it is essential. Uh, following Ratzinger in terms of how he expressed faith in the catechism, let me tick off several characteristics of faith according to the catechism of the catholic church uh, faith is a grace that is it's a, a gift of god uh, it's a supernatural virtue that's infused by him into people though it is an it is a human act so our intellect our reason our will cooperate with uh, god's gracious activity uh, faith is linked with understanding. We've just already talked about faith and reason. Faith is not counter to reason, but embraces it. So faith is linked with understanding a reason. Uh, faith is free. It can't be coerced. No one can be forced to believe. Faith is necessary. That is in terms of being necessary for salvation. But let's remember, right, with the Roman Catholic theology, salvation, justification is not just by faith alone, that's the Protestant sola fide, but it's faith plus the sacrament of baptism. So uh, faith is going to bring uh, come about with this, uh, with the sacrament of baptism. 
faith can be lost. Mm. So here we're working on a libertarian view of human freedom. So freedom, uh, faith is a, a free gift of God. And so if they persist in sin, worldliness, carnality, they neglect the sacraments, the means of grace, they're apathetic, uh, they can lose faith. So the opposite is they need to nourish faith. And primarily uh, by going to mass, participating in the sacraments, hearing, responding to the word of God. So faith requires effort. Faith is uh, working through love, right? Um, so uh, it, this, this idea of uh, there's no view of perseverance of the saints and no, obviously, assurance of salvation because faith can be lost. Sure. Also, faith is uh, faith is a beginning, right? It's it's. Uh, the, the destination is eternal life, but it begins with faith. So there's, uh, a, so there's an embracing of the beginning of eternal life, uh, leading to what Catholics call the beatific vision, seeing God face to face. And lastly, faith is not placed in propositions about God and his ways, but faith is placed in the realities that these propositions point to. So faith is an encounter with God, uh, God himself. Yeah, it's much more personal. It's not just, uh, yeah, faith in, faith in ideas. It's faith in, in a person. How does but it, it also involves ahead. assent to the doctrines of the Catholic Church, right. which then completely ties the Catholic Church to faith and people's encounter with God. Sure. So, for example, an adult... Uh, who's not been baptized, wants to become a Catholic, goes through uh, you know, th this whole catechism period, up, upwards of a year, and uh, right before his or her baptism, the priest asks, uh, what do you ask of the church? And the response of the one to be baptized is faith. So faith primarily is a gift of God communicated through the church. That's the primary notion of faith, even before our own personal reception of this. Hmm. Yeah, so assent uh, is really important. There's a pretty well-known theologian within uh, Carl and, and my uh, and Jim's uh, ecclesial communion, <laughs> our church, uh, named Gordon Clark, of course, uh, who did not think that assent was a, was a necessary component of faith. Um, and... Uh, it wasn't received well <laughs> in our church, <laughs> in our denomination. Not like it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So, how how then does hope fit in? How does faith relate to hope then in this regard? I could see a different kind of aspect for it and an importance, considering there is no assurance of faith and no uh, perseverance of faith, and hope as a theological virtue might take on a different character. Yeah, uh, it's it's hard to pinpoint what hope is, according to Benedict, because in various places he makes it interchangeable with faith. Uh, so he particularly likes Ephesians 2.12, description of non-believers are those without hope and without God in the world. So for Benedict to receive hope is to come to know God, which sounds very much like faith. So they're very much interconnected, but faith uh, is primarily, uh, sorry, hope is primarily expressed uh, when there's persecution, when there's suffering, when there's difficulties, faith, uh, sorry, hope comes to the forefront. And it really is looking towards the future and living that future reality in the present. Mm. And finally, you know, love is considered. And um, one of the one of the works that I certainly noticed uh, and um, as most significant, and there was a lot of talk about it at the time when it was released, but uh, Benedict's Deus Caritas Est. And you also describe this and, and, and speak about love um, as it's described in this work, but you describe it as a remedy, or at least many people have seen it as a remedy to Vatican II's, um, some of its documents. How... Can you describe that or explain that to us? And why why would some of those documents, particularly, um, well, the pertinent ones, why would they need a remedy? So the very first papal encyclical that Benedict published uh, is entitled Deus Caritatis Est. Caritas Est. So God is love. It was Christmas Day, uh, 25th of December, 2005. 
And a good number of Catholic scholars do see this as Benedict's attempt to uh, remediate Vatican II's uh, pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spets, which was 1965. Um, Vatican II in Gaudium et Spes discussed human dignity, emphasizing three things, the intellect, along with uh, industriousness, uh, to emphasize the conscience, along with the search for truth, looking for solutions to uh, societal problems, and three, uh, freedom, along with self-control and free choice. But in its discussion of human dignity, Gaudium et Spes never mentioned love. So for some scholars reading uh, Benedict's encyclical, they take it to be a corrective to this missing point. Yeah. Human dignity is first and foremost grounded in the revelation of God who is love. So right. that's uh, that's why they see it in the, that light. Well, and he, he emphasizes an important point, which is in one regard kind of an, an obvious point to make, but this Again, uh, I, I apologize for bringing everything back to Rahner, but it was a huge feature of Rahner's theology, just as it is with Ratzinger's to a degree, this identification of the love of God with the love of neighbor, that the two are coterminous. You cannot love God without loving your neighbor and, and vice versa. They, you, you can't split them or separate them in that way. And so seeing um, Benedict wanting to kind of add an addendum as Pope, or uh, further flesh out how love reply, or applies to, to these interactions, that's an important point. It shows you something of his heart and his concern as well to kind of introduce that. I would wonder if any historians have looked back at that, I'm sure somebody has, and try to uncover any debates or, or thoughts or arguments uh, at the time of the drafting of some of those Vatican documents to see if that was something that Ratzinger campaigned for at the time, and then it wasn't included, and then when he became Pope, he added it later. I don't know. Sounds like a good dissertation topic. <laughs> <laughs> we just yes. have to find, uh, perhaps these are not documents, but they were at the uh, the German meeting or something like that. <laughs> You'll have to go find them amidst, uh, amidst some uh, beer steins and uh, lederhosen. <laughs> Who knows? Carl, um, you know, you, you, you tie up your ch chapter uh, speaking about uh, Benedict and uh, Catholic ecumenism coming out of Vatican II. And again, just to reiterate, I appreciate your, your take, and it was helpful for me to round out kind of my own thoughts and views on this. But we see here Vatican intera or, uh, Benedict interacting with the Vatican documents and in one way, shape, or form kind of in interpreting them. Uh, so a mutual acquaintance of ours, uh, uh, Matthew Levering, co co-authored a book, or at least co-edited a book on Vatican II, and Benedict wrote the preface for that. So high praise <laughs> if you're writing a book and you're trying to <laughs> trying to argue how to interpret Vatican II. If you could get the Pope to write your preface, that's probably probably a, a good stamp of approval. Um, and so there, they're arguing for a renewal within a tradition rather than more of the John O'Malley side of things who advocates for more of a, of a liberalizing. That's a radical shift. You know, nobody argues the fact that the church is different afterwards. The question really is on what basis or what principles. Is it a renewal within tradition and a return to an older, more pristine kind of tradition, or is it going in an entirely new direction? Um, how, how would Ratzinger view this? And, and how do you see him personally as, as someone continuing on the tradition, deepening it, uh, or, you know, trying to just take it in a different direction? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm probably not competent really to, to answer that, but I'll, I'll give it a stab. I Does think he harden the church? Maybe I could ask you that. Do you think he hardens the church's stance? Um, I don't think so. I was persuaded by his reading of the Vatican II documents. Now, I know that the, the readings are contested, and these are, as we know, even within our small Presbyterian world, uh, committee documents are at points studiedly ambiguous. Or, yeah, that's just 300 in order people. To keep as many good people on board as possible. But I was persuaded by his, his read, and I thought it was 
pretty consistent with what I understand the Council of Trent to be saying. But again, if you set it against the background of the Council of Trent, it certainly isn't a hardening. There's, there's clearly a more charitable <laughs> approach to Protestantism being, being projected. So I would say uh, uh, I, I was persuaded. I also, it, it left me thinking, I'd always bought the idea that, that Ratzinger was this liberal leaning guy at Vatican II who did this convenient switcheroo when the big job was offered to him by John Paul II, et cetera, et cetera. I was persuaded looking at his stuff from the late 60s on Vatican II that no, he's, he's been a pretty conservative oh, yeah. figure yeah. for many, 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 many decades. So... Uh, I don't think he, I don't think he hardened the church at all. I think he clarified the teaching of Vatican II in in a very plausible way. And I, as I made a, a couple of times, I said in the article, I'm I'm not offended by his his approach to ecumenism because, as Greg said r- right near the beginning, it's good to be dealing with somebody where what you see is what you get. He's not a Catholic pretending to be a Protestant. He's a Catholic that treats Protestants with respect, it seemed to me, but also was essentially saying, look, I treat you with respect, but this is what you are, according to the teaching of uh, of my church. So I don't think he hardened. I, I don't think he hardened the church. How his read pans out in the debates that go on about Vatican II within the Catholic Church, I, I don't know. But it didn't seem to me that he'd significantly narrowed things at all. Certainly, if you take the long sweep of Roman Catholicism, and if there's a church on the face of the earth where you should take the long sweep, surely it's it's the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I've always, you know, just touching on Vatican II in general, uh, yeah, my friend Francesca Murphy is a conservative reader of Vatican II. And her point that you know, this is the church that produced Humani Vitae fairly shortly after the close of the council. If Vatican II is, is the liberal opening up of the church that some claim in retrospect that it was, where does Humani Vitae come from? I, I think that the whole tenor of the, of the radical liberal reading of Vatican II strikes me as having not only internal problems relative to the documents itself, but broader contextual problems right. in terms of the direction that certainly the magisterium seemed to be going in the late 1960s, even if that didn't percolate all the way down. There, it's an interesting historical question to, to, to see how are we to interpret and understand the church and how do Catholics interpret and understand it themselves? But I, I think the, the addition of Francis just adds so many other questions uh, to, our, to our docket, you know, <laughs> and trying to figure out if, if this story, this book was written, uh, you know, right upon, if, if let's say Ratzinger finished, you know, died in office, and then the book was written right then. To me, it'd, it'd, be, it'd, it'd be quite different. And whether or not the people at the council thought of the council as a certain thing, uh, that in some ways is a different question from how it will be received and used in years to come. And so to see Francis and the positions that he may take and to find out whether Francis is just a little parenthesis period or if he is kind of a, a, a preview of things to come, this is this is where we are right now. And um, for many, many years, people thought there would have been a Vatican III by the 1980s, at least. And I don't, I don't know the inner workings of uh, Vatican City at all. I don't really want to. But uh, the way Francis goes about things, per- perhaps he's the one to, to call for another one of these meetings. We don't know. I don't know. So we mentioned uh, Leonardo Di Chirico uh, a couple minutes ago, and I think his uh, framework of thinking about this matter in terms of Roman Catholic, Roman being the particular right. uh, hierarchical reality, Catholic being more universal and reaching out. I think we would definitely say Francis emphasizes that Catholic element. Right. We see it in the latest Amazonian Synod. We see it in his dialogue about atheists uh, and, and, and his ecumenical uh, overtures and things like that. I, I don't want to say then that um, 
Benedict was the Roman emphasis because obviously there's also some Catholic element in it. So the framework, you know, it can't, it, 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 it's not a tried and true. It has to be one or the other. It's, it's a both and, but I yeah, would say right. uh, we've got emphasis on the Roman aspect, emphasis on the Catholic emphasis, and definitely what we're seeing with Francis is the latter, the Catholic emphasis. Yeah, the that's, a, that's a wonderful way kind of to think about it. And what, what you just said there, both and, uh, that's that's always the operative thing. Whenever we're dealing with the uh, Roman Catholic theology, it's always both and rather than either or. Things are not dealt with in these binary situations, but more in a holistic perspective. Whether Roman and Catholic is a is a dialectic, maybe that's another question for Jim to answer or, or uh, to entertain for another day. But uh, uh, I, I've enjoyed my time with you today, brothers. Thanks so much for joining us. I don't want to keep you any longer. I've already kept you a long time, but uh, perhaps we can we can come back around and talk some more about these ideas in the future. But it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks so much for your contributions to the book, and we we encourage you in these efforts and ask that you would uh, keep thinking and keep writing. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah. Thanks, and, Camden. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful Good to, to see, see you. Greg. you. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank we'll you. We'll certainly want to stay in touch. I do want to uh, point people to the various websites. We'll have links to the the places to go and to the articles and other publications in in our episode description. And of course, we're online at reformedforum.org. If you'd like to get in touch with us, there's an easy contact form there. It's perhaps the, the simplest way to do it. Uh, but I do want to encourage everyone uh, to, to pick up a copy of the book, The Theology of Benedict uh, the Sixteenth, A Protestant Appreciation, edited by Tim Perry, published by Lexham Press. And I do want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.